it's good that you are here. As I heard um, Pastor Vernon Rainwater say at my son's church some years ago, as we gather here together in this place, we bring the church into this building. We are the church. And when we enter this place today as the people of God, we come to worship and to bring praise to God. I am glad that you are here and pray that you will be blessed as we worship God together. Um, for those of you who may see this electronically, we are glad that you are with us as well. If you are visiting us, welcome. We are so happy to have you. Um, if you are visiting, uh, for visitors or for any of you, if you might have any prayer concerns, there are little cards in the pew that that you can put into the offering plate when you leave this service. Um, following our service today, I encourage all of you to join us for our fellowship time to extend this wonderful time of community that we have a little bit longer and enjoy this in with one another. Uh, there are several announcements that I want to bring to your attention. We have lovely, lovely flowers this morning. Um, Flowers in honor of Jim and Sue Harris, who are celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. And flowers in memory of Jane Jackson. Tomorrow will have been Jane's 90th birthday. And by the way, on Tuesday, Jimmy will celebrate his 95th birthday. <laughs> and air hope in the resurrection, and you'll find those details in the bulletin. I also want to inform you that Paul Fleming has given us permission and asked us to share this information. He is in the hospital, he has a serious illness, and expects to be coming home, but he also had a stroke last night. And I believe if you wanted to communicate with him with cards at his home, that he would welcome those. Um, Further announcements, Monday evening Bible study will meet tomorrow night. And this is an open group. If you've never been, you are welcome. You can come once. You can come every week. You can come every time. Um, the Congregational Care Group is beginning to update the directory, and they want your picture. They want to take your picture during fellowship. So talk to Betty or Ben about this. Um, today is Communion Sunday, and in the way of Communion Sunday giving, uh, this month we are collecting car gift cards for teachers in Northumberland and Lancaster counties for special projects. Great opportunity. Check those details. And finally, um, we are looking for a Sunday morning um, child care person. And if you know someone, that might be blessed to do this, that might bless our children. Um, talk to them, take note of the, the details in the bulletin. Again, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Let us worship God together.
please join me in the call to worship. It's printed in your bulletin. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is the Lord and compassionate. Let us walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let us pray. God of love, you teach us a life journey that calls us to deny what is unhealthy and unloving. Lead us in that pathway. Awaken us to the ever new abundance that is ours through your word. In the name of the one who died and rose, Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Please stand if you are able as we sing our wedding hymn.
Do you ever have birthday parties? And what do you do at birthday parties? You get present and cake. That's right. Sometimes when we celebrate, we like to eat things that we like. Um, sometimes I like to celebrate by having all my friends come over and cooking lots of food and having a big feast. And, you know, we do that at Thanksgiving. Do you know what Thanksgiving is? When everybody gathers and you have turkey and dressing and gravy and potatoes and desserts, pumpkin pie, all that stuff. And you get together with your family and you celebrate. You talk about things you're thankful for. This table is something that Jesus told us to do. Uh, Jesus had a meal with his, with his closest friends. And he told them that, that after he died, he wanted them to celebrate who he was. And the way that he wants us to celebrate and remember him is that, that this, is like a, this is like a feast. And at this feast, we break bread and we eat bread and we drink the juice. And when we eat bread, we remember who Jesus is. And when we drink the juice, we remember who Jesus is. So Jesus wants us to celebrate and we like to celebrate. And the reason that we celebrate this it's because we want to remember and know and celebrate how much Jesus loves us. Remember this. Jesus loves you. And you are very special. And thank you for being here with us today. Let us pray before we hear God's word. You speak to us, Lord, with tongues of wisdom. Let your Holy Spirit now open us to hear with greater clarity the teachings of today, that we may hold dear in yet new ways what it is you will for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
to be a prophet while he's living at the temple with the priest Eli. He's going to be, Samuel's going to be both a prophet and a judge. Samuel is to be the last judge of Israel, and it's going to be his ministry to anoint the first king of Israel. It's a tough time and a major shift in the history of God's people, for these people were so special, God's chosen people. And God was to be their God. God was to be their king. And so this call by the people to have their own worldly king was a rejection of God. But God says that he will give them a king. And as we read last time, um, God sends Samuel and Samuel anoints Saul. And then later, there is a public ceremony where Saul is accepted and proclaimed king by the people. You saw that yesterday, didn't you? In many cases where King Charles III was proclaimed or pronounced king of England. Saul has some military victory, but unfortunately, Saul is not obedient to God. And God withdraws his favor from Saul. God rejects Saul's kinship. And so today, it is some years later, God has rejected Saul's kinship. And we find Samuel grieving for Saul's failures and God's rejection. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely this anointment is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in, 
Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Samuel is grieving God's rejection of Saul as King Saul had not followed God's plan. Saul's failure and the consequences of these failures were difficult for Samuel to watch and to see. You know how that can be when you see someone making mistakes and you wish you could change them and you wish they could avoid the consequences of their action. God tells Samuel to move on, to go and to anoint another king. Samuel struggles to move on. He is afraid to go. He is afraid that if he does what God tells him to do, that Saul will kill him. But God presents a plan, and Samuel obeyed, going to the family of Jesse to anoint the king. He invites Jesse and his sons to consecrate themselves and to join him at the sacrificial banquet. Each of the sons is presented to Samuel, except for David, the youngest, who was not even called to come to the special occasion, but left out in the field to watch the sheep. The first is Elia, a fine young man, so fine that Samuel immediately thinks, this is the one. This is God's anointing. I know what I'm doing, this is it. But God says, don't look on his appearance or his height, because I've rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. How do we measure? How do we expect to be measured? How do we evaluate what might be worth something to God? Eliab looked good. And after Eliab was presented, then it was Abinadab, and then it was Shema, and then four others. And God rejected them all, chose none of them. I'm sure Sammy goes, hmm, now what do I do? And then he says, is this it? Are these all your sons? I guess seven seemed like a pretty good number of sons. And Jesse says, there is the youngest out in the field. Not even thought a possibility. Not even included for the choosing, there was one last possibility out there. Not important enough to be brought in. Samuel had to ask them to wait and to bring this boy. I guess he was not the family's most likely to succeed. But they brought him, and they waited until he came. They couldn't do more because this was the task that they were there to accomplish. And it was David. It catches us off guard sometimes. It's called God. It finds us in strange places. This is where we're not waiting for God to act. Maybe we're in the middle of other things and not expecting. God chooses and uses who we would not pick. This call uses not the great and the mighty, but it uses the heart for God. Samuel thinks, surely this one, or surely this one. But it is the least expected that God chose. When others see not much, God chooses and uses who we are and what we have. Sometime back I shared with you a story about taking a trip 
to a cerebral country where I kind of organized a, a youth mission trip way out of my league. And I shared with you that um, this was really quite a stretch for me and that I only agreed to go on this trip because I had a friend who had, um, who was working with an agency that organized these trips and planned them. And I would only go and only take these youth and many parents on this trip if she would personally accompany us there to make me feel safer. I want to tell you just a little bit more about my friend that took us on that trip that time. I might have shared some of this with some of you on occasion. It's quite a good story. But if I did, I apologize for repeating, but it is such a good story. and so relevant to what we're thinking about. But I do want to share it. The story goes back a long time. It goes back to the days when Glenn and I were um, young, married, probably younger than most anyone in this room. That was, was a while back for us. Um, and we were members of a church that was very involved in missions and in short-term missions. And we were also very involved in the young adult singles group. They used to hang around our house a lot. I like to cook, and I guess they like to eat. <coughs> and so we, we made a good team, and they would be at our house. And the Young Adult Singles Group was planning a mission trip to a, a third world country in Central America. And as the trip began to come together, and people were signing up, we were all surprised by the news that we heard that Mary had signed up to go on this mission. In fact, it was the joke of the day that Mary was born, that they would allow her to go. She felt like that this was something that God had laid on her heart, and she needed to do it. She needed to go. She had the time and she had the money, but for this trip, that was about all that she had to offer. Even she had trouble accepting that she was born on this trip. Why the surprise? Mary was not used to roughing it. Central America was definitely roughing it. She lived alone in a nice house with a pool. She had a maintenance service for the pool. She had household help. She held office hours at Friendly's on Broad Street every day for lunch. And that was the lifestyle that she lived. That was the hardest way that she knew life. The conditions for the trip would be primitive as they built a church and conducted Bible schools for children. She couldn't cook. She didn't like children. And she could not build an outdoor toilets were off of her list. But that's the way this trip would be. There were other people that seemed so much better qualified, better choices for the trip. But many of them were somewhat new in their careers, being young, and they just couldn't get the time to take this trip. And others didn't feel the call. Mary had the time. Mary had the money. And Mary felt the call. She had the heart. And she said yes. She was apprehensive. Terrified might be a better word about the trip. And God and I were, like I said, very involved with these young people. And yes, they were talking a lot. It was the talk of the day. We could see that her decision to take this trip definitely fueled their conversation. Old, faithful Mary going to Central America. People wondered out loud, even in front of her, how would she survive? They asked her, how would you survive this? And they talked about the burden that she might be on the trip. 
I mean, she was 40. 40 years old and going on a mission trip. All those young 20s and early 30s, she was over the hill. Sounds so young. But how could God choose this one for this trip? This could be like taking a shepherd out of the field and putting him on the ground. What a stretch. When Samuel went to Jesse to anoint the next king chosen already by God, when he saw the first son, he thought, Oh, this is the one. He knew. But God said no. And Abinadab, and God said no. And Shema, and God said no. And then it was no, 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 no. God said no. God chooses, and God chooses who he will. Often, the unexpected. Mary offered herself to God. She offered God her time and her money, and she wanted to serve God. And her heart said, go. And soon she was off to serve God's needy with the other volunteer missionaries in Central America. Two years later, Mary took her life safe and went to seminary to study missions. For years, she served with international missions, eventually forming her own organization. In her ministry, she traveled to many third world countries, planning and leading mission trips, recruiting volunteers to join her, and finding funding for many, many projects. With God's vision and provision, she helped involve hundreds of United States churches and missions and orchestrated medical mission teams, the building of houses, training schools, evangelism, and many other projects. I have pictures of her, this one who professed that she did not want children. I have pictures of her with little children hanging around her. Isn't it amazing what God can do? In 1983, she was the least expected choice for this trip. But she said yes to God and offered her gifts to God, and God used them. Transformed by God, she has affected thousands of lives. For each year, hundreds go to Mexico, the Caribbean islands, South America, Russia, all over the globe, in the name of Jesus, to continue work that she began in 1983. As I was remembering, it was also long ago, and she died sometime back. I couldn't remember the name of her agency, and I wanted more information, so I was kind of surfing to find information. And I did find a little note on a uh, high school newsletter page that was on the occasion of her death. And it said that, it noted that she had introduced hundreds of people to missions. I'm sure she never saw this coming. And it would have been easy to say no. But she responded, and God, it was God that provided all that she needed. When I think of David, that great king of Israel, I think back to him as a boy in the field, shepherding the sheep. And I wonder maybe, maybe it was that time out there with the sheep, alone with God, <coughs> that developed in him that heart for God. <clears throat> the seven older brothers, last in line for succession, I'm sure that he did not see himself as the future king. 
But when Jesse paraded the others in front of Jesse, no, 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 no. Not one of the seven was chosen by God. But David had a heart for God. And God said, David will be my king. No one saw this in a shepherd boy, but God chose him. God said yes. And when God says yes, isn't that an exciting thing? When God says yes, Next week we'll see that David quick knew that with God he will be a winner. But God does work in amazing ways. He chooses the least expected. He gives power to the powerless. He uses us in ways that we cannot. For David, it may have been a really lofty moment when he was anointed to be king. But from that moment forward, David was absolutely dependent on God for the rest of his life. He needed God's help. He needed God to be his rock, his fortress, and his deliverer. When we say yes to God, it is not because we are able. It is because we trust God. If we cannot trust God to act, to use us, to equip us when he chooses us, we might be embarrassed. We might fail. We might be humiliated. But we are counting on God to act. We are counting on God to make it happen. David could not have been king without the power of God. Mary could not have done missions without the everyday provision of a loving God. How does God take a shepherd and make him king? How can God transform us from where we are to where we need to be. It is through God's steadfast love and awesome power. Jesus was a perfect revelation of this. Jesus came to be one of us, to suffer and to die for us. Surely that proves something to us about God's steadfast love. Jesus overcame the power of death. Surely that proves something to us about God's unfailing power. This transforming love and power is what makes the difference what bridges the gap. When this God acts, this God of transforming power and love, when this God acts, when this God chooses, you and I are free to act with confidence. For this God does not
those who seek him to come and to join us as well. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we praise you and give thanks for your mighty work. You commanded light to shine out of darkness, divided the sea and the dry land, created the universe, and saw that it was good. You created us in your image to live with one another in love. You gave us the breath of life and freedom to choose your way. You gave us your promise and your purpose and called us to live in your way. <laughs> when we were separated from you by our sin, in your steadfast way, you loved us still and were faithful still. Merciful God, we praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, God incarnate, to walk with us to live in love and perfect obedience, and by his life, death, and resurrection to overcome the power of sin and death. Jesus, the friend of sinners, is our eternal hope. Remembering your faithfulness and your love, we break bread and we share the cup, giving thanks, celebrating your saving love in Christ. As you raised your Lord from the dead and call us with him from death to life, we give ourselves to you to live for him in joy and grateful praise. O oh God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon these, your gifts of bread and juice. Make them to be for us the body and the blood of in a spiritual way that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his self-giving. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us, announcing his death for the sin of the world and telling of his resurrection. Draw us together into one body and join us to Christ that we may be glad and faithful people as we feast together with them. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be glory and honor forever. Amen. And as we gather as the people of God in this place, we are united as that one body. And let us together, as our one body, share the needs of our church. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you that you hear and see the concerns that we know that we have, and that you alone are able. And so we lift to you those with special needs. For those who grieve, especially the family of John Dickey, Lois Panther. Bill Brand, and the deaths. We ask your comfort. We also pray for the family of Queen Elizabeth and all those who mourn her death, for the nations impacted by her passing. Let your comfort and presence be known in all of these places during this time of great transition. We pray for Ethel, Dick, Dottie, Jack, Robert, Matt, Lee, Jean, and Charlie. Their challenges are many. Meet them where they are and provide for their particular needs. And open our eyes to see how we might care for brothers and sisters. Thank you for the memory of Jane, who was such a significant part of this church and community. We pray that you would bless Jimmy, 
joyful memories and as he celebrates that big birthday. Be with all those who celebrate birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, promotions, back to school, new relationships, and other special life moments. We remember and lift to you Jim and Sue as they celebrate 70 years together. Lord, there are many joys that we celebrate, but today we also remember a different kind of anniversary. We remember today that it is September 11, a day forever etched in our minds as a day we witness a great loss of life and a violent attack on innocent people. You are the God of great comfort. By your spirit, bring peace to all those who lost loved ones, who lost a way of life, who today hurt beyond understanding because of that day. We thank you for the courageous men and women who stepped up to help, and we pray a special blessing on all of those who willingly place themselves in harm's way day after day around the world to help others. Teach us your ways, O oh God, and still in us a desire to be like Jesus, to be people who give when we might be inclined to take, a people who serve when we'd rather be served, a people who do the hard work of forgiving when holding a grudge would be easier, a people who love when it is so easy to hate. Help us to be a people who grow to be like Jesus. Hear our prayers as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was at the table with his disciples. And after blessing it, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup the new covenant, my blood poured out for the sins of men. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us take Thank you, God, for these your gifts. You've given us a share in the one bread and the one cup and made us one in Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and joy to the world. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is so good and has blessed us so richly. Let us return to God our gifts and our offerings of our life. Uh, as you leave today, you'll find there's a plate at the back. If you have gifts that you want, you may place them in that plate. May, may God bless these gifts and bring, may they bring honor and glory to God, our Lord. Um, and I
and let us stand and sing together, praising God for his goodness, the doxology, and then together we will be made stand and sing it. Let us stand with joyful voice.